Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land upon which we meet, as well as elders, past, present and emerging. State Library acknowledges all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and the continuing connection to land and as custodians of stories for millennia. We are inspired by this tradition in our work to share and preserve Queensland's memory for future generations. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to Tara Jean Winch in conversation with Melissa Lukashenko as part of the Talking Ideas series here at State Library of Queensland. I also acknowledge and welcome publisher Penguin Random House and senior publicist Bella Anapur, who is traveling with Tara tonight. My name is Alana Hunt. I'm a Barkin woman now living in Brisbane. I work as an editor intern in the Black and White Indigenous Writing and Editing Project, which is about creating more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander editors and authors in the publishing industry. I'm in a wonderful team comprised of Grace Lucas Pennington, Jasmine Nagaki, Megan McGraw, and Angela Renshaw. I'm also a writer, which is how I know Tara Jean Winch. I won the Boundless Mentorship through Text Publishing and Writers New South Wales last year for a YA novel. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Tara has been my mentor, uh, providing hours of advice, reading over rewrite after rewrite, I'm sure until her eyes were burning. <laughs> but she has never stopped pushing and inspiring me to do better. She is generous with her ideas and her time, while at the same time working on her own novel. This is the first day I've met Tara face to face. She's <laughs> been really lovely, and she's as lovely in person as she is via Skype and email, which is really saying something. So, as you came in tonight, you will have noticed some rolling images of native Australian plants and animals. These are just a small selection from the State Library's vast open access online digital collection. So shortly we'll be joined by award-winning writer Tara Jean Winch in conversation with Melissa Lukashenko. Tara Jean Winch is a Wiradjuri author born in Australia and currently based in France. Her first novel, Swallow the Air, was published to critical acclaim in 2006. Before it was a multi-award winning published novel, Swallow the Air was recognised in the 2003 State Library of Queensland Young Writers Award and won the David Knighton Award for an unpublished manuscript by an Indigenous writer at the 2004 Queensland Premier's Literary Awards. Queensland was early to recognise Tara's writing talent. Mm -hmm. I have to say I was a judge on the United States. Slide that Second book, the short story collection After the Carnage, was longlisted for the Victorian Premier's Literary Award for Fiction, shortlisted for the 2017 New South Wales Premier's Christina Stead Prize for Fiction, and also shortlisted in the Queensland Literary Award short story category. Tonight, Tara will be discussing her latest novel, The Yield, with Melissa Lukashenko. Melissa Lukashenko is an acclaimed Aboriginal writer of Guri and European heritage. Since 1997, Melissa has been widely published as an award-winning novelist, essayist, and short story writer. Her novels include Too Much Lip and Mullumbimby. Her recent work has appeared in The Moth, 50 True Stories, Mianjin, Griffith Review, and The Saturday Paper. Just this week, Too Much Lip shortlisted for the Miles Franklin Awards. <laughs> So a huge congratulations to Melissa. So please join me now in welcoming Tara Jean Winch and Melissa Lukashenko. Yeah. We're crying already. Hello. <laughs> Thanks, Alana. Well done. Yes, well. Jingari Dimbalung, hello, friends, and uh, welcome. I'll just start by saying that Tara is quite nervous, so we all need to just repeat after me. Don't be nervous, Tara. Ready? <laughs> One, two, three. Don't be nervous, Tara. <laughs> it's jet lag too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a funny kind of job we've got. We sit in rooms for years on end looking at blank walls and talking to no one except ourselves and the voices in our heads and then they plonk us in front of scores or hundreds of people and we need to um, talk. Okay. 
And um, Tara's come prepared with my novel, Too Much Lip, and apparently she's going to fire questions back <laughs> at me. <laughs> so um, I wasn't expecting that. I'm sure you weren't either. Okay, so the yield, Tara. Let's, um, let's start with the obvious question, the title. I think it's a very evocative title. Obviously a word that has multiple meanings in English, in Wiradjuri. Do you start with titles when you write? Because very often I've had a title before I've had a book. Yeah. And the title has just, boom, come out of nowhere as if it's been bestowed upon me. And mm. then I, I realise that somehow there's a book that goes with it and I just have to find that book. So Hundred exactly the same. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, the yield was there first because I always knew it was going to be rural. It was going to be about wheat. Yeah. It was going to be on... Nuremberg, yeah. it was going to be on country yeah. and it was going to be like agricultural at its essence. Okay. okay. So, I mean, the f and I always had this line in my head yeah. um, for years and I think it was from a dream yeah. and it was, this is a dark field uh -huh. and it just was present and I knew it wasn't, I, kn I knew I was going to call it the field. Right. But yeah. Okay. Okay. And I wanted a book that was the something. Yeah. Um, but the same, like the next novel is Hotel Vague. Uh -huh, uh -huh. The one after that is called Saint Idol. Like it's yeah, there. Yeah, so they're, they're stacking up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> my daughter's older now. There's yeah. a huge gap, obviously, in publishing, but mm. my daughter's 13 now. Mm. She doesn't need me to be 100% on her all the time. So yeah. hopefully I can. Yeah, start pumping them out more yeah, quickly. Yeah, that's the plan. Right. Right. <laughs> so the wheat is interesting because yeah. um, if I remember correctly, you grew up uh, coastal yeah, small yeah. and and Wiradjuri country. I know you didn't grow up on Wiradjuri country, yeah. but Wiradjuri country is mostly inland and a lot of it is wheat country, I'm assuming. Yeah. Yeah. So do you think, um, was that a deliberate decision that it would be about wheat or is that something that came to you as you were trying to evoke the country, I suppose? I reckon there's all these, when you, uh, it's always, when you answer these questions, don't yeah. you reckon it's always a bit of the truth and then at the time it was instinctual mm. and you can't mm. actually name what it was. Yeah, oh yeah, very much so. Mm. But uh, when I was researching Swallow the Air, yeah. that I needed to, uh, now that I know that you're the judge, <laughs> 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 you'll know that it was really spare, there was hardly anything there of a manuscript or you won't remember. It was a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't it wasn't a finished manuscript, even though um, it was for a manuscript prize. And I needed to keep telling this story. Mm -hmm. And she was, May was going home. Oh and I needed okay. to also, I'd been out there before, but I needed to return to finish Swallow the Air. So this was 2004 yeah. that I went out again a lot camping yeah. and... Um, to meet relatives that I'd never met before, walk mm. down streets that yeah. my grandmother had grown up on, mm. things like that, go so to condo, condo. So for condo. anyone that doesn't know where we're talking about on Wiradjuri country, it's central New South Wales, yeah. yeah the, the wheat belt, that fairly dry, not desert country, but dry pastoral country. Yeah. Murrum, um, no, I keep calling it the Murrumbidgee <laughs> yeah. Murrum River, Murray Darley ba Darling Basin and some of the tributaries around there. Yeah, and you were about to say Condoglin, I think. Yeah, Condo. Condo, yeah. yeah. Condo Mission, I had relatives yeah. grow up there. So okay. that was part of Swallow the Air. And in that process, I remember um, borrowing a car and driving down to th in that direction. Mm. And a locust storm came out of nowhere. Oh, wow. Wow. And it was a thick, like, it was insane. I had to pull over. And How I'd biblical. And because I'd grown up the coast, I'd never mm. experienced something like that before. The windshield yeah. was covered. Yeah. And it was so, yeah, biblical. Mm. Um, what a gift for a writer. It was. <laughs> yeah. But then it wasn't, it, it stayed with me all those years, but it didn't go in swallow mm. the air. It's not yeah. biblical. Yeah. But I went to Wagga, just outside of Wagga, and I did a one-day course in Varadri. Oh, yeah. Uncle Stan Grant Senior, senior I thought and so, yeah. Dr. John Rudder the year before in 2003, mm. and if I'm wrong, it's 2002, had just put together this A4 yellow, uh, quite thin at the time, dictionary mm. of revitalised Wiradjuri language. Mm. And I bought that. Dad's still got it actually in his caravan. Yeah, he yeah. still carries it around. And 
in Swarovia Vieira, there's about four words in Wiradjuri. Right. For example, mm. Bila, that means river. Yes, yeah. And after the Swarovia came out, I realised oh, I was so moved by learning some language because mm. mm. my father was in a boys' home when he was three. He didn't grow up with language. Yes. And it, it was like this balm almost. Yeah. It was yeah. a huge... It was so moving to even include those few words and I knew then, in 2004, that I wanted to do something on the next novel that was about language. I wanted to expand yeah. that. And I think people don't always understand the long gestation period for a big novel like, you know, an important novel yeah. like this one, hey, is um, I think most of us as writers have experiences that we've um, kept close to our chest for years and decades yeah. and which eventually find their way into fiction but it's got to be the right book at the right time hey? completely so yeah. you know uh, almost what 15 odd years ago your yeah. experiences with the locusts with the wheat belt with the language i mean they're still bearing fruit and uh, yeah it's it's not you can knock out a novel in six months but um i think the big novels uh, are a long time in the making. Yeah, and it's when I say, oh, it's worked on for 10 years, you know, that's mm. been kind of been thrown around. Mm. It's not that that's all I tried to do. Yeah. And so much is about just reflecting on the on mm. the idea and and waiting for those that perfect situation when you've got the different ideas that you crash together and then they mm. work perfectly. Yeah. And then once you've got that, which can take years, and it did take years, mm then it's that idea that's at the horizon, you've got to chase it yeah, yeah. and just put your whole self into it and c for the, those, well, for me, for mm. a couple of years straight at the desk. Yeah. yeah. Because otherwise, if it's too long, it's like the idea moves away from you and then you start to question yourself. Yeah, yeah, it disappears over the horizon. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Speaking mm. of ideas crashing together, the book um, is written with three voices and... Um, S they're in different time periods, uh, sort of. One's a contemporary voice. Um, let's let's talk about them in turn. So the first voice is that of August Gundawindi. Um, August is the prodigal daughter in a way. And August has come back to country. Lots of parallels here with oh my yeah. novel, purely by chance. The zeitgeist was at work. August comes back from overseas, in her case, from uh, London where she's washing dishes and trying to work out who she is at the age of 29 or 30, yeah? Uh, and comes back to the family home, which is called Prosperous House. And w w were you trying to... Um, is, is it intentional that she's something of a prodigal daughter or uh, was that just the way the character... Um, wrote herself in a way. Like, was that intentional? Do you reckon she's a prodigal daughter? <laughs> <laughs> That's one way to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Only in the sense that she has left and left a lot in her wake. Like, she left suddenly when she did leave, didn't she? Yeah. Yeah. It's not that she left in disgrace, but the family aren't terribly impressed that she took off. Well, let me rephrase the question. What, <laughs> um, how do you see August? Like, what? <laughs> did August was really hard to write. Was she? Yeah, that's interesting. It doesn't read like that on the page. That was the hardest, uh, hardest thread to write by far. Okay, okay. That was tor like torturous. The easiest was Poppy. Well, Poppy's voice is just brilliant. That just came super natural. Like it yeah. broke my heart writing Poppy's voice. Yeah. It was like, um, it's a mixture of my grandfather's voice who's passed and my dad heaps. Yep, yep. And then it's also part of this voice that's like that internal voice that leads you around in your life. Yep, yep. You might not listen to it, but it's telling you how to live well, yeah. live a good life, be a good person. An ancestral voice. Uh, yeah, the one that yeah. I never listened to. <laughs> okay. Did you Did you know your grandfather? It sounds like it if you oh, say his it's voice. My, yeah. yeah. It's my poppy actually on my mother's side yeah. and my father mixed together, melded okay. into one. Yeah, yeah. He's a beautiful character. Um, I, I was going to talk about I him I didn't third. answer the question about August because I don't know if I can. Well, um, 
I think we do need to talk about August as the protagonist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me why she was difficult to write or what, what you struggled with. I guess because oh, there was lots of, uh, okay, August is going to be in first person. So the whole novel was written in first person. Oh. And then I was like, no, 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 it's too close. I have to yep. change it to the third person. And yep. then it was changed back. Right. There was a lot of... Um, whether it's too close because yeah. she's too close to her pain. Yes, yes. So I had to, I had felt like the decision was made that I had to give her a tiny bit of distance so it's, yeah. a, even it's in third person. Mm, mm. I guess it was hard because it was this literary, that was the literary type voice. Okay, um, okay, yeah. And because I guess, oh, that's really hard. Sorry, Mika. No, let's skip over it. I don't want to... I guess you. it was more like that I sometimes I felt like I didn't have agency and so to give her agency was really hard. It's interesting that you say that because August comes back feels like she, she's in a place where she had once belonged yeah. and it's not till a good way through the novel that she does feel like she belongs once more at Prosperous House where yeah. she was raised by her grandparents along with her s sister who's now missing, and yet um, when she does belong, she says something like, she belongs again, but it's to the saddest place on earth. So, um, I mean, I used the word tortured before. Is, is she a tortured soul? Completely. I think she carries all of it. Yeah. I think she can see it all. Mm. Because something happened to her when she was eight. Yeah. Do you want to talk about what happened to her and the power that she developed? Um, or just tell tell people this, maybe this. I could read the yeah, passage. Sure. Yeah, Does absolutely. that sound all right? Yeah, yeah. Because I, I think she says it best. Don't you reckon the version yeah, the novel is the best version of yourself? <laughs> 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 like this is what I wanted to say. Everything that comes out is so wrong. I'll just so um, give a bit more plot summary while you're finding okay. that. Uh, yeah, so there's three voices in the novel. The first is August Gundawindi, a young Koori woman who's come back from London uh, to the ancestral home at Prosperous House, which was previously Prosperous Mission, set up by the Lutheran Reverend Greenleaf. Uh, and his is the second voice in the novel, this uh, voice through... Uh, recovered letters of the reverend so we get this um, viewpoint of the german missionary on what's gone on uh, at prosperous mission and what the early colonial period was like and then the four uh, the third voice is the voice of poppy albert um, august's grandfather and he tells his story through the mechanism of a dictionary which uh, we'll talk about in a little while uh, it's, um, there's a little bit of it, actually. Yeah. It's a great book, so whatever you read oh. is going to be just fine by me. I can't, I'll read a tiny bit, but it doesn't sum it, I guess, sum it up, I guess, and I'll try and talk about it, too, because okay. then I'll, maybe I'll remember. Do you want to just tell <coughs> people where we are in the story a little bit? Um, oh, I'm really stuffing this up. I'm <laughs> jet lag's really got its claws in me. All yeah, right. This is your copy? Probably. Yeah. It's got the, the page <coughs> bent back, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which wouldn't be helping. <laughs> <laughs> so <sighs> it's hard to tell. It, like, So it opens with Poppy. Maybe I can open with Poppy and yeah. come back to yeah, August. Yeah. All right, let's open with Poppy. Should I read a little sure, bit? Yeah. You said 11 and 12. Uh, yeah, I was going to read that, but you go for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll start from the beginning so you can hear. Uh, no. Oh that'll God. be a long piece then. Just do 11 and 12. Okay. And go from there. <coughs> Poppy introduces his idea that he's going to tell everything that he's ever known and all the words he found on the wind. <coughs> Pardon me. And then... Um, so the w the narrative is interlaced. So he's telling his story, but it's yeah a couple of chapters down the line. Mm. 
Mm. This is chapter three when he starts to tell his dictionary. <coughs> Yarran tree, spearwood tree, or hickory, acacia. And then the word in Wiradjuri is Yarrani. The dictionary is not just words. The little, there are little stories on those pages too. After years with the second great book, I figured out the best way to read it. First time, I went in like reading the Bible, front to back. AA words first. There you find Aaron and him in the book of Exodus, brother of Moses, founder of Jewish priesthood, aardvark, that animal with the tube nose that eats the ants of Africa. There are abbreviations too, like AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, where people go to heal from the bottle that punched me in the guts. My mummy, she said, the Aborigine is a pity, my son. She said everyone was always insulted by her, no matter what she did. So she let herself do the most insulting thing she could think of, take the poison they brought with them and go to town. You could keep reading the dictionary that way, front to back, straight as a dart. Or you could get to Aardvark and then skip to Africa, then skip to continent, then skip to nations, then skip to colonialism, then skip back to empire, then skip back to apartheid in the A section. That happened in South Africa. Another story. When I was on the letter W in the Oxford English Dictionary, Wire would be in that section. It means no. Wire wasn't there though, but I thought I'd make it there. Wheat was there, but when I skipped ahead, not our word for wheat, not Ura. So I thought I'd make my own list of words. We don't have a Z word in our alphabet, I reckon. So I thought I'd start backwards. A nod to the backwards white fella world I grew up in. Start at Y, Yarrani. So this is the once upon a time for you. Say it, Yarrani. It is our word for spearwood tree. And from it, I once made a spear in order to kill a man. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a beautiful passage. The sting's in the tail there. <laughs> so, Poppy, uh, the man behind the dictionary. I think Poppy is one of the great elder characters of Aboriginal literature, is, is what I decided when I read the book for the third time today. And uh, there's a great shortage of elders of recognition of elders in Australia uh, overall. I don't just mean in Aboriginal society. And so I, I was um, really impressed and really moved by his voice. Early on, um, can I see that? I'll see if yeah. I can find the exact quote uh, where Poppy's introdu being introduced or introducing himself. Oh, yeah, he says... Um, the one thing I thought I could control was my own head. It seemed the most sensible thing to do was to learn to read well. So in a country where we weren't really allowed to be, I decided to be, to get water from the stones, you see. I do, I'd like you to say something about the idea of, of choosing to be um, against a society that, that says you know, Aboriginal men, particularly in that era, um, weren't allowed to be anything, weren't allowed to be literate, weren't allowed to be anything more than a labourer or, yeah. or a prisoner. Is that something you draw from your grandfather? It, it's f more my father. Yeah. 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 My it, Then the book, actually, the dedication, when we were doing the final pages, yeah. I kept changing the dedication because yeah. it was always for Dad. Okay. <coughs> And then I was like, oh, no, family are going to get pissed off about that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's for it's my a family. Couple of bases. <laughs> yeah, 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 for yeah. my family. <laughs> but um, Dad doesn't read. Uh -huh. um, he's always been a labourer, taxi yeah. driver sometime. Yeah. Um, he's never read Soil of the Earth. Yeah. And yeah. he'll... Oh, this will come out in the audio book, so maybe you'll listen to that. Uh -huh. He's not interested in all that fussy stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's about, it's f yeah, this is a book for my dad, for sure, mm, mm. because of everything that's happened to him. That's how recent it feels for me. Mm, mm. Dad lives back on country now in the bush yeah, um, yeah. with his dog, 
and was super happy. Yeah. And but he missed out on language and a lot of his culture and it was my like gift to him to be able to you know, he has that dictionary that I gave well, him. I was just going to say, around. he may not read literary novels, but he's got the dictionary. Yeah, yeah. but it was more like a way to, t- to draw him in, into the yarn of it. Yeah. And, and then he'd be excited and, and, and see some of the stories that happened in our childhood. Yeah. Because they're not just, you know, um, there's all different kind of tangents that Poppy goes off on. Mm. Like he talks about when they go camping and you mm. light a main fire mm. and then you dig out mm. holes around the campfire. Yeah. And then you put the coals in the holes. Yeah. And then you feed the coals back into the main fire. And then you lay down a beach towel into the little dugouts, sort of the gulamans mm. that you've got in the ground. And then you've got a nice warm spot. Yeah. And the fi- and the stuff that the dad did, you know. Yeah, yeah. So um, it was all my father focused. Mm. But you said he grew up in a home earlier on. Yeah. Um, in so there's, there's a direct parallel there with Poppy's story, isn't there? Because Poppy's yeah. removed very young in the book and yet becomes this elder figure, this this instrument of culture. Do you want to talk about who gives him that cultural instruction after having been removed, removed at a very yeah. young age? So Poppy is a time traveller. Yes. So when he was in the boys' home and they took... Um, there's a line when he's in the cots and he says... I never forgot about my mummy and the people of the river. Mm. Every night when I'd lay in my room, I'd look at the moon mm. and my urine would run like quicksilver over the Hessian clots to wake my schoolmates. Mm. Um, and then one night, and uh, one day actually, he's outside under the sign that says, think white. Mm. Act white, be, be white. white. Mm. And he sees a woman appear in the boys' home grounds mm. And she says, Wonga Dyeong, to him, mm. he, she comes up to him and he says, what's that mean? She says, it means lost but not always, mm. and told him to remember it. And when he turned around, she was gone. There was just a, mm. I think it was a crow on the, on the fence that went around the boy's home. Mm. And then he says, and then every night, you know, my great, 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 great grandfather would come and take mm. me out mm. and the river would just appear wherever we went and they'd tell me about this and that mm. and they would giving him culture to become men mm. a man. Yeah, mm. and it's it's a process throughout the novel, isn't it? It's not a one-off. It's no, a th- they stay it's with him. It's a, a, um, a, uh, actually an initiation over a very long period of time until you say, at you know, close to the end of the book, that the, the ancestors say, OK, you're like an initiated man now because yeah. you've learnt what you need to learn in life. And they disappear for a while when the whirly whirlies come. Mm. Do you remember that? Yeah. When the bad spirits come, they can't come anymore. Yeah. And then it's part of the narrative t- and mm. secrets that are within the family. Okay. So Poppy is the link um, between the distant past, the ancestral past, and the present because yeah. August was ra- August and her missing sister, Jedda, was raised by Poppy and Poppy's wife, Elsie. Yeah. So uh, I think it's time we bring in the Reverend Greenleaf. And uh, he is a German, a Lutheran. He's an immigrant and he's an honourable man for his time. And we're introduced to him in his own words as a man who has seen uh, not first contact but close to first contact on Wiradjuri land and who's decided uh, down the track that he has to speak up and he says, I will tell that unhandsome truth, meaning the truth about what he's witnessed and heard about. Where did the decision to include a German voice come from? Well, okay, first of all, <laughs> I've got <laughs> the idea, yeah. this piece of the land, but then I this piece of the country mm. r- on your bank. Mm. I'll do it with my hands. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And then, but then I wanted to talk about Australia, mm. and so I compressed all of Australia into 500 acres yep. on the banks of the Murrumbee River, the fictional yep. Murrumbee River. Yeah. And then I wanted to tell the story of everything that had ever happened on 500 acres. Yeah. And to tell that story, I had to have 
Poppy mm. be able to be a time traveller. Yeah. So he could talk to the ancestors and they could show him the land and he everything could span that the centuries, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And then I had August in the contemporary action mm. and discovering the dictionary and how that helps in terms of fights that to protect the land, land rights and native title. Mm. And then I knew that in order to in order to tell the full circle of that five hundred acres and to talk about the stolen generation, mm. assimilation policies, talk about missions and stations, I had to have all that happen on the same 500 acres. Mm. Mm. And there's pockets of Australia that still believe that children were taken away for their own good. Oh, very much so, yeah. And so I wanted to turn my antagonist on its head and make him almost seem like a good man mm. to show the reader that yeah. even if you'd believe that, that mm. his, this was a good man, it's still bad. Mm. Everything's, the outcome is still bad. Okay. Yeah, certainly the outcome is obviously yeah. bad. But I I read Greenleaf as a man who was uh, in his own way, mm. although he has an epiphany towards the end, doesn't he, that he's, his missionising yeah. has been you know, deeply flawed and that he's come to it as an arrogant, with an arrogance that, you know, is not justified at all. Yeah. Um, and I thought the only way he could understand that, coming mm. back to your next question, is mm. why was he German? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I thought the only... I knew the timeline where I had to set it. Yeah. Which was the mission was opened in 1880. Yeah. And then I knew that he would have had to undergo, at that certain time in history and in with those mindsets, he would have had to undergo... Um, a discrimination against himself and his tongue, mm. his tongue as well, yeah. which was German. And mm -hmm. so he had to be then Lutheran. Yes, yes. And then during, of course, First World War, there was posters around that said, do your bit, kill a German. Mm. Um, German communities, Lutheran communities, their shops were raised and, um, and Lutheran churches were mm. burnt down. And he's threatened with internment. Is he actually interned? He yeah. Is. yeah. He's writing this from internment. That's right, yeah. He says, I yeah. will not be sent to the secret bush, the gallows of the secret bush, mm. or here in the internment fences. Yeah, so the great irony of someone... Although he, the mission that he runs is not uh, necessarily the kind of mission that we're familiar with here in Queensland where people were incarcerated on government reserves up until the 1960s, very early 70s, uh, and literally imprisoned. His is um, a far more benevolent place. And, and as, you, as you describe it, it is a refuge, very much a refuge from colonial violence in some senses, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And that's what I found in my research, that, mm. that some residents were allowed to come and go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on Warangesda, which was what the mission was based on. Okay, okay, yep. Yeah, and he actually purchases a firearm in the book, doesn't he, in order to defend the women from raids of drunken whites. Yeah, but he also town. denies the people of... He pushes the Bible and mm. encourages them not to use their native tongue and do their ceremonies at mm. different points. At different points, yeah. 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 Which leads, of course, to Poppy and his uh, reliance on the Christian Bible as a as a source of strength in a way. He's, uh, he draws a lot on the Bible. He does, yeah, for the stories. And mm. and he says something like, you know, it was my friend sometimes when I was a young boy referring to the Bible. Yeah. And I'm not Christian. I'm n I was not writing that. Mm. I've found um, there are some Aboriginal people that have embraced Christianity. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah and I wanted so. to show that side that that, ca that can you can straddle two worlds. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And August has a, a really different response when she finds a Bible in the family home, doesn't she? Upon her return, they're packing the house up after Poppy's death. Yeah. Uh, the house has to be vacated because it n it isn't owned by the family. Yeah. It's not even owned by the white family white farming family, yeah. it's a 99-year lease. So the mining company wants to move in. And August is trying to find what Poppy was working on. So um, that's obviously a metaphor for her trying to find the culture that Poppy has to leave behind, yeah. But in the process of doing that, she finds a Bible as well. Yeah, mm. in one of the side tables, because there were 
you know, they grow up in the old prosperous mission, mm. which is the old church, and it's had extensions built f in years before for shearers, for, for seasonal workers. And so there's some ha some beds with bedside tables, and she finds a Bible in the drawer, mm. and she uh, takes it and chucks it in the bin. Yeah, which I found, uh, I was actually shocked. Um, I found it a shocking act, maybe because of what's been in the media in the last couple of weeks with Israel Folau and um, that um, scandal or that you know, issue being in the news. So is are we to take it that August um, rejects Poppy's Christianity while searching for his cultural trove? Yeah, but I think it's more like the first, it's like a turning point in her finding her own agency and making a decision for herself. Okay. And okay. she says it was never the book she was looking for mm. because the mm. reason she goes to England in the first place is because they read books when they were kids and, yes. you know, England was this not colonial home but this like idealistic place where they had mm. queens and kings and mm. kids with long socks and yeah. boiled candy and her sister and her made a, a tape recording and sent to send to princess diana yeah <laughs> because they were right into the princess idea uh okay we've got about five more minutes before oh, we take a couple of questions. questions oh ask away but before you do <laughs> tell me um <laughs> uh, maybe tell me about the the place of Wiradjuri in your life. Um, I know for myself, I began learning Yugambeh Bunjalung language um, at a community meeting in Bean Lee in about 1989. And from very slow and sparse beginnings, I've now got a, you know, a bank of language at my disposal. I'm not fluent, I'll never be fluent, but uh, when I wrote um, Malambimbi, the, the, it was maybe 5% language and uh, of, of all the language in the book I needed to look up three words and I'm quite proud that when I realised that I went you know well I'd finished the book and and then I um, realised that I hadn't had to actually go to the dictionary except occasionally for spelling. It's incredible. Yeah it, it's amazing what you, pss, what you pick yeah. up when you're living on country and thinking to yourself and occasionally having conversation with some words in it. Yeah. With another Yulgan Bear Bunjalung speaker. But um, I wanted to ask, obviously you live overseas, so it makes it um, difficult on that level. But in your life, what is the role that language plays, Wiradjuri language? Um, it'll always be something that I work on. Mm. I'm really terrible <laughs> <laughs> because I've just taken my French citizenship test, so I've had to be studying France non French non-spoke. Okay. Um, and I'd like my daughter to learn. I guess writing that book in the dictionary was a gift to dad, but it was also something that I hoped my mm. daughter would read to and mm. her, hers with yep. another generation. But You've just inspired me to read the one of the very last entries from the dictionary or in the voice of um, Poppy. Which I I oh yeah. I was going to ask you how it felt to write language, but you've already answered that question. <laughs> My pronunciation of the word will probably be off here, but almost at the very end of the book, Poppy has an entry, ashamed, have shame, gil dure. And he says, I'm done with this word. I'd leave it out completely, but I can't. It's become part of the dictionary we think we should carry. We mustn't anymore. See, pain travels through our family tree like a song line. We've been singing our pain into a solid thing. The old ones, the young ones too, are ready to heal. We don't have to be Gialdure anymore. We don't have to pass that down anymore. So I, I, I think that, um, that really speaks to us and to uh, the shame that we've been made to carry for, you know, there's been a lot of signs that say be white, act white, yeah. think white in all our lives. And in I different I ways, I completely. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really beautiful um, part of the dictionary to have near the end. The NAIDOC week as well. Mm. <laughs> okay, I'll answer one or two questions and then we'll okay. um, turn to the audience. I This is like really good, you have to buy it. I made sure that there was lots of copies out there. Um, this is, I wanted to ask you about the process of rewriting mm. the beginning 
part of the novel. As you know, 5,000, the sort of beginning of the yield 5,000 words was published in 2016 yep. in Westerly. Yep. And you th there's evidence of that there, but there was so much rewriting, rewriting, mm. rewriting. I wondered mm. how many, what that process is like for you. Do you start at the beginning and rewrite and rewrite and then and have it, have your have your idea perfect enough that you can see the whole story and then go? Or do you no. write the whole thing and then... No. I, I wrote this book differently to how I write most books. I usually have a very good idea of where I'm going yeah. um, from chapter one to chapter 20 or whatever. With this book, I only knew what was going to happen in about the first six or eight chapters. And I knew that in detail and then after that I just could not get it to work and I don't know if it's menopause, I don't know if it's the complexity of the book, but I just could not get the plot to mesh and it just reached a point where I thought I have to start writing and just hope and sure enough it, it did work its way out eventually but that, that was um, not my usual way of working and I always work from the be beginning of the book through to the end. Okay. Uh, in almost... Um, to the nth degree because as I said before I'll, I'll have a plot I mean I'll have a uh, title before I have the book and the title will just drop into my mind yeah it will rise up from the ground or someone or you know somewhere it comes from and uh, then I know that there is a book to go with it and it's a matter of finding that book but I always write beginning to end and then I'll go back and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite and the introductory chapter um, or section is always the hardest because it must be absolutely spot on. Yeah. And I probably rewrote that 50 times. Yeah. You can tell because it's exact to the line, mm. perfect, mm. every line. And chapter one, two. Oh, thank you. Could you just say that a bit louder? <laughs> <laughs> and it's only twenty nine ninety nine <laughs> From all good bookstores. Can I just, I just would love to read a couple of lines from you. Sure. There's <laughs> Carrie's... Carrie's riding along in her motorbike and she goes past the vacant lot with its waist-high weeds hiding a generation's worth of fag ends, torn condom wrappers and empty bottles, <laughs> past the landmark pub which hadn't changed in a century and wasn't about to start now, thanks very much all the same. <laughs> <laughs> and when Carrie had made it to the other end of Main Street, that was about it for Durango. Am I saying that right? Durango. Durango. Place of Centrelink fraud, according to Ken. Population 320. <laughs> now, as ever, if you wanted anything more complicated than a beer, a bale of hay, or a loaf of last week's bread from Kath at the general inconvenience store, <laughs> you had to make tracks for Pato half an hour up the highway. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> how do you write like that? Can you please tell <laughs> us? <laughs> how do you write lyrically and something that I could never ever do? Oh, which come is on. comically. Which is comically. Yeah. How can you do how how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you in on the secret later on. <laughs> uh that just reminded me though that I wanted to ask you about setting and, and whether you took the setting for the yield um, more or less directly from real life or whether it's a composite of a lot of places. Complete composite. Okay. I, okay. I don't want I, what about here? Is that one town? It's a composite, but it's um it's a composite of very specific areas. So yeah. if you take Billy Nudgel. Don't name them and Boona. towns, they'll get pissed off. <laughs> no, no. No, it's not any one. If yeah. But if you take Billy Nudgel and you take Boona and then you take a little bit of Mwollombar and a little bit of Casino and you plonk it all right in the middle of those four towns, yeah. or maybe a bit south, then you've got the setting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all places it's where I've spent <laughs> time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think it's time we took a couple of questions. If people have anything they want to... Um, ask or complain about <laughs> or <laughs> <laughs> query. 
Hey, Tara. Um, thank you so much for coming tonight. Big fan. Um, I just wanted to know about the character of Aunt Missy. I loved her, absolutely loved her, and I wanted to know if she was a composite or if that's just one person <laughs> that you're drawing from there. Um, Aunt Mims Missy's sweet, isn't she? But she's also... Oh, sorry. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> I've got my so. um, She's a composite. And all the aunties are. Actually, my dad's got heaps of sisters that end up going to the girls' home. And his sisters are, most of them except for um, one of them who's a bit like Aunt Missy. But Aunt Missy's also touchy my aunties are like pinch ya and push ya and poke ya and tease ya yeah and like when i was go like my breasts were budding they were like what's that <laughs> <And> like <laughs> so i wanted to tone that down but that's still in there that <laughs> sort of playfulness and oh it's horrible <laughs> Um, that sort of playful touchiness and... So basically Aunt Missy is a composite yeah. of lots and lots of horrible aunties. Yeah. <laughs> then, yeah, and one nice one. Right, okay. <laughs> and then the real life aunties will have to guess which one that is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. mm. Mm. While you think of another question, audience, um, tell me about living in Europe and uh, writing... Australia and I, I imagine well in a way I imagine that it's difficult but then I've often written books immediately after leaving a place yeah. and it seems like the juxtaposition between living in a completely different place enables a, a, an amount of distance that yeah. helps the process how, <laughs> how do you find it well I reckon there's two stages there's one stage where you've just come back from I always go to Charles Sturt University. They've got a house out there called Wagga Wagga Writers Writers. Oh, okay. Do you know it? No. You should go and stay out there. Mm. And you can stay there. Writers can stay there for free. It's really run down, not fancy at all. Okay. But I'd go out there and smell everything and touch everything and take mm. the photos and feel the granite and mm. soak it all up and then have to go back. Mm. And then you like, you've just got the things that were the most that feel all those senses that were most meaningful to you. Mm. So it's like you've got a sieve and you're panning for gold. Yep. And yep. You then you've got that gold so you know it's significant. Yep. And then there was other times when you're right in the thick of it and I'd be like running around. I live in the like Loire countryside of France. I'm like running around looking for a eucalyptus tree to like yeah, rub yeah, against. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then something that was helpful was there's a lot of bird watchers in Australia. Ah, amateur amateur yep, bird watchers. Yep, yep, yep. And they'll put up videos... Um, on YouTube that are like four or five hours long. Right, <laughs> yeah. And I'd watch them for days, uh -huh, uh -huh, yep. which is handy when you're overseas. And But like, for example, there's this um, description of the sound of the bush and I couldn't hear it. I knew it, mm. but I couldn't find it, couldn't hear it. There's no mm. way I could find it in France. Yeah. And I wrote, and it's a five word description. It's cicada friction and bird whip. Right. Is this a Wiradjuri word that you're talking about? No, no, this is the sound of what a bush sounds like. Oh, okay. okay. I think that's what it sounds like to me anyway. That so cicada, cicada friction, friction, yes, and, and bird, bird whip. whip, like whoop. Yep, yep. And that yeah. like yeah. in the, you know, the cricket, crickety, cicada -y things mm. in the distance. Mm -hmm. That took about five months to write those five <laughs> words. <laughs> right. Just listening to these YouTube videos and right. trying everything. Okay. Okay. And do you think anything of France made itself, made its way into the book or not? Yeah, yeah, I think it was harder to, I, I think it was harder to speak a more relaxed Australian. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I think it made it more formalised. Okay, okay. Because I wasn't around that accent so much. Right. I think it made it more difficult. I think you yeah. captured a very um, particular Australian voice. Well, it's your voice, of course. Um, I didn't, I didn't think there was anything that wasn't Australian and wasn't East Coast Australian yeah. about about the dialogue uh, or the vocabulary. I thought it was um, <coughs> very consistent and clear throughout. Thanks. Yeah. Even though you're writing in this these three yeah. fairly different characters, I think they mesh beautifully, and. Uh, 
is, if there aren't any other questions. Oh, I was going to ask you one, but I'll let it, I'll ask you later. Over okay. a beer. No, go on, go on. <laughs> <laughs> About dialogue, because Melissa is an absolute champion of dialogue. When you write it, the way I wrote, the way you do dialogue, do you s are you can you see it all playing out? Because it's exactly like the f it's it's so tight, so good, and that's the thing I struggle with the most. Never had a problem with dialogue. I think there's bits of our brain as writers yeah. and like there's a sunset bit and there's a, <laughs> you know, eucalyptus bit and there's a sound of the cicadas bit and whatever <laughs> the dialogue bit is, mine, um, mine works, you know, well because dialogue I've always found really, really easy and the book is being adapted for TV. Okay. That's yeah. excellent. <laughs> Makes... As I fully expect the yield to be, it's a really beautiful book. It's an important book. I've read a lot of books uh, in my work and it's not often that I don't want to put the book down to go and have lunch or to, you know, do what needs to be done in the day. I, I really didn't want to put this book down. It's sensational. So if you join me with, uh, join with me in thanking Tara and then all <laughs> rush outside. <laughs> Thank you. And this one too.